I'm Sarah Jackson, and this is Internal Comms Pro, the podcast. We're getting the gears turning as we talk to the experts on our ever-changing world of internal communications. This season, we're shifting the mindset. I think the flexibility and really appreciating the flexibility of working from home is important. And in fact, if you read any of the literature that's designed for managers around how do you build remote teams, and how do you hire remote workers, the number one question that you always ask is what do you love about working from home? And I think that's interesting because if you can kind of get yourself to love it and appreciate the unique positive aspects and similarly sort of make smaller the negative ones, you're going to have a lot more fun and be a lot more successful working remotely. Employee wellness. It's a topic that has been talked about a lot. People are still wanting to learn more and rightfully so. Ever since the world transitioned to hybrid or remote working environments, employees have been trying to shift their mindset. While we hear stories of companies who've discovered that their workforce is more productive working from home, you might still be struggling. Maybe you're finding it hard to keep focus while working in the same environment that you used to relax in. You could be struggling to set a routine for yourself now that you're no longer in the office. These are all valid concerns and you are definitely not alone in feeling them. Our guest for this episode, Phil Strazula, founder of Select Software Reviews, has talked with dozens of people who've experienced exactly what you're feeling. So today we'll be discussing how he personally set a routine for himself, as well as the tricks he uses to keep himself focused. So let's focus ourselves and let's dive right in. My name is Philip Strazula and I'm the founder of Select Software Reviews. Before we get started, tell us about what is uh, Select Software Reviews? Tell me a little bit about your business. Sure. So we are a website that helps the HR community stay on top of what's going on in the HR tech world. So there are thousands of tools that you can use for anything from paying your employees through finding the right engineering talent through using artificial intelligence in all sorts of different ways. And so we spend our days trying to figure out what's going on in all these different spaces. And we write up our research on our blog and allow anybody in the whole world for free to access this information. Wow, that is amazing, especially since I've tipped my toe into the HR waters and uh, I there's a lot that we're going to be building and doing, so I can't wait to check it out. So give me a little bit of your backstory, you personally. How did you get involved in the HR community? Sure. So I originally started my career off in venture capital doing early stage software investing. I'd always been interested in finance. I've been investing in the stock market since I was 12, studied finance in college, got into VC, and I really wanted to start my own business. And so I went to business school, got my MBA. And while I was there, I taught myself how to program. And I just sort of started working on all these different projects that I thought were interesting. And one thing led to another. One of those projects sort of became a uh, thing that solved a need for HR professionals, which I knew absolutely nothing about. And so I sort of found myself building this little HR SaaS business that about three years ago, I hired somebody to run as a general manager. And so I had all this free time and I was in the HR space. I love to learn. I love to teach. And a gap that I saw in our world was that it was becoming increasingly difficult to find and buy the right tools just because there were so many and there were so many sort of negative signals online from really biased content. And so I just started this blog essentially that grew and grew and it started off as a bit of a side project and all of a sudden it's become <laughs> what I spend most of my waking hours on. So uh, that's a sort of a roundabout way, but, but I'm in this now and, and I love it because HR impacts your work world and we spend so much of our time at work. So it's such an important part of people's lives in general. I love that you have this communication background. Our, a lot of our listeners, obviously, are internal communicators. They sit in the HR community. So this is so interesting, kind of this 
um, you know, mirage of skill sets that you have to kind of bring and, and talk to us today. I know we're talking about employee wellness, and I know that, you know, we're all kind of working from home. A lot of our listeners are working from home and, and they're trying to sort of help, uh, I guess, be healthy in this new normal. So, um, talk to me a little bit about, maybe some unknown, maybe even disadvantages with employees of, of working from home and, and that might happen when you're trying to adapt to now this new normal of, of being at home working. Sure. I think the number one disadvantage is that the world of work and the world of life are completely blended together for many people. And you see this in the data, HBR put together this really interesting study that shows email patterns before and after the pandemic and people were doing emails way into the night, first thing in the morning, et cetera, at much higher rates than beforehand. And I think it's because you're always one step away from your computer and, and all of a sudden your kitchen table, your couch, et cetera, is your office. And so there's actually been some really cool studies that show the people who create routines and create spaces within their mental and, and physical lives do really well working from home and they avoid burnout at much higher rates. Uh, and so this can be like literally as simple as saying, this is the chair that I sit in when I'm doing work and otherwise I'm not doing work. It can be creating a routine. Like, you know, when I start to do work, I have a cup of coffee, I eat breakfast and then I'm in work mode. And when I stop doing work, I have a routine that allows me to sort of wind down and, and realize that it's time to put that stuff away and not look at it for the rest of the evening, as tempting as it may be. Well, I love that you're talking about this because not only do our listeners, I want them to be listening to this, could be for two hats, right? For your for their own selves, because a lot of them play roles where they just have so, I mean, we all have a lot of work to do, um, but their, their role sometimes especially during a pandemic has become a catch-all. I mean, they're not only communicating, but they're developing policy and doing software implementations. So now I'm glad they have a place to go to figure out if they're going to buy the right one or not. Um, and so I think it's important not only for the listener listening to this to get ideas for themselves, but also if they are in an employee wellness campaign to, to pick up some tips along the way. So let's dive a little bit more into routine. So you sort of get a mental routine in the morning. Um, I love that about at night. Hey, shut it down. Are there any other things that you've done to sort of provide a healthy structure when working from home? Yes, there, there are. For me, I really love to block the mornings from any sort of meeting or call. I turn my phone off, I don't look at my emails after I check them quickly, and, and I'm able to basically get in the, the deep work phase. This guy, Cal Newport, wrote, wrote a really amazing book called Deep Work, and it's all about how do you really get stuff done and, and make progress in your professional life. And, and a lot of it has to do with focus. And this allows people to actually feel like they're making an impact, like they're making progress as opposed to sort of maniacally with a lot of adrenaline and cortisol switch from one tab to the next to the next, never really getting anything done. And it was sort of being in that stress state, which is not super fun. And so that has been a really important thing for me. I think also working from home gives you a lot of flexibility. You can't really take a nap <laughs> in the office. Uh, it's not really socially acceptable, unfortunately, in, in many work cultures. But if you were up late with your kids or something else is sort of you know taking away from your sleep you can work something like that in some people are just like much more productive if they have a 20 minute nap midday i personally like to meditate it, during the day i take 20 minutes and just put on headspace and do some breathing work i also really love to cap my deep work session with a workout and that kind of gives me the right mindset to go tackle the phone calls, the emails, the interpersonal situations where as an introvert, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, as excited <laughs> to be in meetings and on Zooms all day long, but I'm, I'm, you know, that's sort of an unfortunate part of most people's job. And so I think the flexibility and, and really appreciating the 
flexibility of working from home is important. And in fact, if you read any of the literature that's designed for managers around how do you build remote teams and how do you hire remote workers, the number one question that you always ask is what do you love about working from home? And I think that's interesting because if you can kind of get yourself to love it and appreciate the unique positive aspects and similarly sort of make smaller the negative ones, you're going to have a lot more fun and be a lot more successful working remotely. Talk to me about if I am a mess, right? <laughs> this is sort of a Maslow's hierarchy, right? I am just, I'm now listening to this like, oh my gosh, I don't do any of this. How, how would you go about telling someone what's the first step so that I can get out of the crazy, especially if my, if my company is like morning meetings and, and how do I navigate that so that I can have figure work around just the demand of the work? Do you, is it, that make sense? Yeah. And, and what I'll say is that when I started working from home, I was extremely ineffective. I did it actually pre pandemic and I basically came to the conclusion that I was not able to work from home. And it was because I was always procrastinating. I was always like, oh, I got to clean the dishes. I got to, you know, take a nap. I got to do this. I got to do that. And I never got anything done. And so for me, I needed to take that initial problem, which was really focus and output and put a strategy around it. And what I did was I found this app called Focusmate, which sounds a little bit weird, but essentially what it does is it matches you up for another person working remotely for 45 minutes at a time. You're on video, you're on audio, you spend the first 30 seconds saying, hey, my name's Phil, here's what I'm gonna get done. And you put it in the chat and the other person says, hey, you know, my name's Mary and I'm a PhD student, I'm gonna write three pages of my thesis. And she writes it in the chat and then for 44 minutes you work and the last 30 seconds you say, hey, Mary, what'd you get done? And there's like this really weird social contract between the two of you that dates back to like, you know, cave people days. And it's really effective. <laughs> and like, I've, I've found that those were the most productive 44 minutes I've ever done in my, in my life. And I would stack those back to back. So I'd have three or four of them back to back. And it just sort of got me in the habit of when I'm in my office, working really hard and focusing and, and not, you know, going on YouTube or something like that. Yeah. So that, that was like my thing. Like that was the thing that really was the foundation that allowed me to say, okay, now let's think about how to consistently make time for that. We'll continue our talk with Phil after a brief message from our sponsor circle. Thinking about launching a wellness initiative to keep your workforce more connected? Broadcast all the info employees need to join in on the fun with an internal communications tool that'll make your friends in marketing jealous. With the Circle Broadcast Suite, you can launch your health initiatives across your most important employee channels at the push of a button. You can even keep track of the crazy amount of engagement through a custom dashboard that you can link and share with your team. Head on over to circle.com slash ICP, that's C-E-R-K-L dot com backslash ICP to see how Broadcast is the place to launch and measure your internal comms initiatives all in one platform. Welcome back. Now in this next part, Phil shares with us the value he's found in learning self-motivation. We'll also learn of a practical technique Phil has picked up along the way. Let's jump back in. I love this because it could be something, again, our listeners with the seat that they're in can model either say, hey, we're going to use that app or maybe even internally among employees so that they can feel connected. They could even start a program to say, all right, you're going to get with one of your colleagues and and you're going to have these 44 minute blocks. I, gosh, this, that is so good. And then it rewires you. And now you might not be in need of the app because now you've rewired yourself to keep that commitment to, to be able to keep that focus for 44 minutes. That is brilliant. I love that. So now how do you get into the maintenance mode of sort of this healthy 
you, you've structured it, you've customized it to the pain points for you for being an introvert. How do you sustain that now and maintain that healthy, you know, work-life balance? I think the words you use are really interesting, rewiring. I think it does sort of rewire your brain to get into this habit and a lot of really good habits. And then all of a sudden it's not too much work to just keep them kind of chugging along. I think I'm also probably lucky. I'm more or less a self-motivated person. I've got my own business and I realize that if I don't, you know, get the stuff done, probably nobody else will. And so that, that is also a very strong motivator for me. And you could imagine creating some sort of like social feedback system where, you know, you tell your colleagues or friends or whoever in your life, Hey, I'm going to do X, Y, Z this week or today or this hour and actually get it done. I actually was, now that I reflect on this, there was one part of my business that I hated, absolutely hated to do in the early days. And thank goodness I've hired people to do it for me now. But I would tell my fiance, Hey, I'm going to do these three things today. And if I don't, I'm going to give you 20 bucks. And for whatever reason, <laughs> like I guess I really <laughs> didn't want to give her that 20 bucks. I, I would just get that stuff done. And so that was like just some random idea that I had one day that, that actually became super effective. And then she would tell our friends on a group chat message, like, Hey, you know, I'm going to get 20 bucks from Phil if, if he doesn't do X, Y, Z. I want to get back to something you said about uh, meditation. I hear you heavily endorse meditation. Talk about that. And, and again, you're giving us so many great apps. Are there certain apps or guided meditation? And, and what benefits have you found from uh, you know using meditation? Yeah, I'm a huge fan. And I think that I originally sort of got this on my radar because I saw a blog post one day that was like, here are you know, 100 famous people that meditate every single day. And it was like, Jerry Seinfeld and Ray Dalio who runs the biggest hedge fund in the world. And, and all these people, I was like, oh, that, that's pretty interesting. Like they're getting this much value from it. Maybe I should look into it. And like many things, it was sort of fits and starts to begin with. I probably tried starting it five or six times before I actually got into a bit of a habit. And I started really small. I was doing it three minutes a day. And what I started to notice was that it had a pretty big impact on my ability to manage my emotions, to think clearly. I started becoming like overwhelmed at some points with the feelings of joy when you see a beautiful sunset. And I was like, this is really weird. Like, why am I so happy to see this sunset? And then I would similarly realize that if I didn't do it for five or six days, I, I, I wouldn't care <laughs> about the sunset anymore. And, and it's nice to feel that way. It's nice to feel happy. I remember going to a friend's bachelor party when I first started doing it. And it was folks I hadn't seen in years. And they were like, you just seem so calm and happy. Like, what's going on? And I was like, I don't know. You know, and, and then I, it sort of hit me months later. I was like, oh, it's, it's the meditation. Like, you just sort of have a different energy around you. And so there were little... And it's hard to really pick up on this stuff, but there were little bits and pieces of data coming back to me that was like, hey, this, this is probably working. And as I started to invest slightly more time into it, I started to notice bigger benefits. And especially if you leave a stressful life or you just want to enjoy life, it is so worth it to take 10 minutes a day that you were going to spend on social media or watching a TV show or whatever and invest it into time with yourself, focusing on your breathing. I have no idea scientifically or otherwise why this works, but it really does help train your mind in much the same way that exercise helps train your body. And in the same way that if you don't exercise, it, your muscles go away, the, the meditation goes away as well, but it, it is so worthwhile to invest in it on a regular basis. Well, I love that you bring it up. I, I think that again, knowing our listeners, they do have such a stressful job. And I think they also sometimes question their own worth and value. I'm sure I'm projecting here in this moment. Um, but if they, if you are listening out there, listeners, and maybe it's just even saying what we're saying now to, I think it reminds you, and especially if you're a writer, right, to sit and, and 
collect your thoughts in some way, the answer kind of comes to you. I think it's almost like you're connecting to what, I don't know what people believe, but there's a higher thing out there to kind of connect to that soul part of you, grounding you, especially I got my gracious, this industry that we're in with, of internal comms, they've been, they've been through the ringer. So I love that you advocate for that as an entrepreneur, as a blogger, as a writer, um, to kind of calm you. I think, I think it's a great, a great practice. So speaking of that, if not only in our, in our listeners, personal lives to take on some of these things, but again, with you kind of working with HR types and being in this world and being an entrepreneur, I'm sure having to sell your idea. If, if I am an internal comms, how can, um, myself working with HR go about helping employees to get to this more healthy work-life balance. Do you have any ideas of if I wanted to start a program or communicate a program, any tips about embedding that into your company culture? How do I go about doing that? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of really interesting ideas and energy around this right now. So first of all, there are a lot of tools out there that are designed for corporate wellness sort of initiatives around mental health. Modern Health, Ginger, Lyra, Spring, Talkspace, Calm, Headspace all have B2B offerings that allow HR, cons, et cetera, to evangelize mental health internally, do programming, offer things like therapy, but also just offer things like meditations that are specifically designed for workplace stress and, and things like the Sunday scaries that a lot of your employees might go through. So I would definitely check out those offerings. I think that for me, the, the thing I'm just sort of projecting my own journey here, I got interested in this because I was inspired by very successful people who I wouldn't have thought would be meditators talking about how it impacted their lives. And when I looked at that, I said, huh, there's something here. I need to pay attention to this because we all have so much going on in our lives, but that was the spark for me to focus on it and giving it a little bit of focus and then seeing the results was enough to continue to grow that practice. And so I think that if you have leaders in your company that meditate, which is probable, or you could bring in outside speakers, maybe folks who are really big in your industry or your geographic business community. I would bring them in to talk about how meditation impacted their professional and personal lives. And then the next step is to just making it accessible, allowing people to subscribe to Headspace and pay for it through your company, offering some sort of programming, et cetera, maybe even time during the day, carve it out make it a group activity. Those are great ways to get started. Well, I love it. I love just the holistic approach of how you approach your business and tech and meditation and focus. I mean, just even your sample daily agenda is golden. We'll get this all in our show notes. If people wanted to you know, connect with you on a personal level, it, would you be open to them sort of contacting you? This is something we sort of ask folks um, if we can put your LinkedIn profile in there if, if they had more questions. And since you've been just a model of, hey, this is how you get stuff done and be productive and have, you know, a wonderful life. I, I just, would you be open to connecting with our listeners? Yeah, of course. If anybody wants to find me, check out the show notes. Or if you're just listening to this, you can Google Phil Strazula with two Z's and two L's. Uh, pretty easy to find on LinkedIn. And uh, if you need further help, select softwarereviews.com on my email. And I think even my cell phone's on there. <laughs> and people do, people do call my cell phone randomly and ask me uh, very esoteric HR questions, which I always appreciate. And I always try to point them in the right direction. Right. Well, I love that they've got somebody, another person in their village, right? Because they don't know, right? They don't know what a, this HR company and this tech company and to have someone that you know, we trust and that said that can give a third objective opinion, like, Hey, I've reviewed all this stuff. And to save our listeners time, my goodness, what a great resource. We'll make sure we put a uh, select software, you know, website in there so that people can get to that. And I can't thank you enough for taking the time to 
to share just personally and professionally kind of so many wonderful tips so that we can have a more well-balanced, uh, healthy life. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for the conversation. There's an old saying that goes, don't set yourself on fire to keep someone else warm. Regardless of what you're doing in your company, it's never worth sacrificing your own health over. At the end of the day, you'll be able to bring your best self to whatever task you need to do if you take care of yourself first. I need to take this advice myself. Well, we hope these little tips and tricks sprinkled throughout this episode will help you get you feeling happy, healthy, and refocused. Now, don't go away just yet. We have a new segment featuring our good friends from Reagan's Communications Leadership Council on how you can use today's episode learnings right now. Let's tune in. Thanks so much for having us today. I'm Mandy zaransky hurst Chief Operating Officer and Head of Leadership Councils for Reagan Communications. Today, I have the pleasure of being here with Michael Waterman. Michael is the Vice President of Culture and Engagement at CHG Healthcare. Michael, thank you for being with me today. I'm glad to be here. This is going to be fun. Yes, absolutely. Michael, it's always so great to talk to you. I feel like you're full of wisdom and insights, but at the same time, you're so honest in your approach, and it's really based around being thoughtful to others. You're such a wonderful soul, and I see that in the way in which you communicate, the way in which you lead teams, and CHG continues to win so many awards for being a great place to work. It's just phenomenal. Michael, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you what CHG Healthcare does. I I want to make sure that we talk about you know, the main focus today, which is communicating employee wellness. But let's talk for a second about what CHG Healthcare does. Absolutely. CHG Healthcare has been around for 40 plus years. We started as a physician staffing business and really originated the concept of locum tenens staffing, which means basically to get a physician to step in and take the place of another when a doctor needs to go on vacation or a doctor gets sick. And we can place anything from, you know, we could place a doctor for a single shift. We could place someone in for a week, a month, or even permanently. We also place nurses and we place therapists. And there's an essential need for our work, especially during the pandemic, where burnout is so high that many doctors, nurses, and therapists, they, they need a break. And so we're able, we have the largest network of doctors and a huge network of nurses and therapists that we can place all around the country and even internationally at this point. And so we've played a, a, you know, a firsthand role in the pandemic, helping support the needs of people all around the country from rural communities to urban areas. I imagine the level of stress and potentially even burnout is, is pretty high for those that are the doctors, but also the staff of CHG. Can you talk a little bit about employee wellness and communicating well with employees as it's a factor of CHG's, you know, culture? Yeah, I would love to. It's, you know, we, we go back to that foundational core value of putting people first and we try and take care of the entire person and make sure they're doing all right. And we also try to make sure that the providers, the healthcare providers we're placing are doing all right. And so there's a real emphasis on wellness and we take a lot of different approaches. I think the, the number one approach that we saw bear really strong fruit from years of, of training leaders to care about people and put their teams and their people first is that during the pandemic over the last year, we saw that those individual leaders really, really connected with their people. They went out of their way to stay connected on Zoom or connected on MS Teams or to make phone calls to people. And then also to encourage people to take time off when they could feel burnout. We also do a lot of wellness challenges. We've done those in the past, you know, like uh, things around the step challenge, you know, do 5,000, 7,500, 10,000 steps a day for the whole month. But during the pandemic, we amped that up because we recognize that the need for overall wellness was so important. So we did a sweet dream sleep challenge. And that meant there were different types of ways that we tried to help people improve their sleep habits. 
we did a, a, a mindfulness and gratitude challenge, which I think was really mean, meaningful to a lot of people because we want to, you know, we encourage people to express gratitude and thankfulness for the things they have, but sometimes in the midst of working, you forget that. And so we gave people a huge list of things that they could do. And if they did one of those things a day, they would get a, essentially a wellness point. And then that wellness point, if you get the certain number of wellness points, that will reduce your overall cost of health insurance. And it's an annual program that we do. I think one of the most meaningful things we do though, is that our CEO regularly talks about taking care of yourself. And he writes a few blog posts each year that encourage people to take time off. You know, his, his summer 2021 post read, it's summer, I'm taking time off and you should too. And so he shared what his summer plans were, which included taking a couple of weeks with his family um, away from the office. And then he asked people to share what they were going to do and post a photo. And we had 54 people comment on that post within the first you know day or so. And um, they posted photos from their recent vacations or they posted their aspirations for where they were going to go. And he responds to those posts. So it's not just talking the talk, but he's walking the walk. And you know we have 3000 employees in our company. If we can encourage all of those people to use some time off, to take time with their family or with some friends or to get out and go for a walk every single day. And if you feel overwhelmed, call one of our clinics, do what you can to help you, you, you feel physically or mentally better. That's really our, our goal around our wellness programs. Let's talk about the fact that you acknowledge mental health days as mental health days. Yeah. I think that's so important from a culture standpoint in that people are encouraged to take a mental health day in that it's okay to call it as such because those kind of renewal of spirit, renewal of uh, mind days off are so important. Yeah, I, I've always been impressed by the level of honesty and vulnerability that our leaders exhibit from you know entry level, like beginning leaders up to our C team, because they will say that. There, there are people that will say, I really needed a therapist. I've never heard so many people say that I've, I've set up some therapy appointments and there's not a sense of shame. There's not a sense of, I've got to hide that from people. And, you know, I've heard people, I've heard people in meetings, leaders, non-leaders say, I'm really fried. I, I, can we just, can we just do an icebreaker instead of talk about the heavy business stuff or just the day-to-day -day business work? And people embrace that and really be themselves and be really honest. And I think that level of vulnerability and honesty has helped strengthen trust during a really, really difficult time. I mean, none of us were prepped to work through a pandemic and somehow we're making it work. But I've seen a lot of healthy and supportive practices from people across the organization, regardless of title, regardless of hierarchy. People just really work hard to support each other. Well, let's end on that note. I don't think that there's a, a better note than the purpose of life being a life full of purpose. And you certainly noted that in today's episode. Thank you so much, Michael Waterman from CHG Healthcare. I really appreciate it. I'm Mandy Zaransky Hurst from Reagan Communications. On behalf of the Communications Leadership Council, thank you again. A huge thank you to our sponsor, Reagan, Mandy Zarinsky hurst and our featured guests for being a part of our new segment. If you're interested in more information about Reagan's Communications Leadership Council, an exclusive membership for senior level communicators and their entire communications teams, please go to commscouncil at reagan.com. Internal Comms Pro, the podcast, is also proudly supported by the Circle Broadcast Suite, an entire suite built for internal communicators. Learn more at circle.com. Internal Comms Pro, the podcast, is produced by the Internal Comms Pro Collective. Don't forget to visit www.internalcomspro.com slash show notes for our free resource guides. Thank you for listening.